What a blessing it is to be with God's people in God's house. Amen. Please pray with me. Dear Father, this evening we enter into your gates with thanksgiving and into your courts with praise. Your face, Lord, do we seek. You are the God of our salvation. And as we open up your word, we ask that you would teach us your way, O oh Lord. Lead us upon paths of righteousness and truth. Direct our hearts and minds. Be our light and our guide. And may we be filled with your Holy Spirit as we dwell richly in the word of Christ. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please open your Bibles this evening to the book of Ephesians, chapter 5. If you have a pew Bible, that's on page 1,244. Please follow along as I read Ephesians chapter 5. I'm going to read verses 15 through 21. And this is what God's word says. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of the reverence for Christ. So I want to spend a few minutes tonight talking about this subject, a Thanksgiving carol. My goal is to help us understand the true meaning of what we celebrate tomorrow, Thanksgiving. The renowned English novelist and social critic Charles Dickens is probably best known in literary circles and those that like to read classics for his noticeable, notable works and characters found in novels like A Tale of Two Cities, Oliver Twist, and Great Expectations. But in America, the work of Charles Dickens that you are most likely familiar with is A Christmas Carol, a novella by Charles Dickens first published in London in 1843. We have read it, watched plays reenacting it, and have watched TV shows and movies performing it. Dickens' book, recounts the story of Ebenezer Scrooge, an elderly miser who is visited by the ghost of his former business partner, Jacob Marley, and by the spirits of Christmas past, Christmas present, and Christmas yet to come. In the process of his, of his eventful night and dream, Scrooge is transformed into a kinder and gentler man. Given the holiday that will transpire tomorrow, this evening we will consider not a Christmas carol, but a Thanksgiving carol. This is a story, a masterpiece of God that he has written to each of us. And Paul described it this way in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So tonight, consider me as your Jacob Marley, a fellow traveler, an exile in this world, and you will play the part of Ebenezer Scrooge. You will be Marley's grumpy, miserly partner, and stranger in this world who needs regenerated and transformed and sanctified. We will think about that, what your Thanksgiving looked like 
in the past, what they should look like in the present, and what they will look like in the future. So let's first consider Thanksgiving past. And if you've been in our, in our church for the last few Sundays, you've heard our pastor teaching from Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 talks about our life before Christ. And in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 21, it describes our thanksgiving before we knew Christ. He says in those verses, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they were, had become futile in their mind and thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. So before Christ, your heart was darkened and desperately wicked. You were deaf and blind to God's goodness, not because you couldn't hear it or see it, but because you chose not to. You suppressed the truth. God's glory and power have always been plain to see. but you inexcusably denied God's existence. You knew he existed. You could see his creation. You could see his goodness. Yet you did not honor him, and you gave him no thanks. Your thanksgivings were hollow and empty because you did not give honor and thanks to him who has given you everything. Therefore, your thanksgiving carol, your celebrations before Christ were futile, worthless, and meaningless. Thanklessness is a characteristic of the ungenerate, unregenerate, and lost world. So that was your thanksgiving past. But what about your thanksgiving future? And Pastor Jay and Seth both gave you snapshots of our future thanksgiving. The passage that Jay read this evening was from Isaiah 12, which describes how the nation of Israel, the redeemed nation of Israel, will one day, as they enter into the millennial kingdom, they will praise and give thanks to their Messiah. And the passage that Seth read is a picture of actually the tribulation saints those that come out of the tribulation and are gathered at the the throne of God. And they're there worshiping and giving thanks. And this is part of what Seth read, Revelation 7, 9 through 12. After this, I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, And crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God saying, amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be our God forever and ever. Amen. This is what our yet-to-be Thanksgiving carol will look like. This is what you were created to do, to worship, to praise, to give thanks to our Creator God for eternity, and as the Scripture says, forever and ever. So that is what your Thanksgiving future will truly be all about. But lastly... And this is where I will spend the majority of my time. It's our present Thanksgiving carol. Because this is where we live. We live in the present, the here and now. And although we love to relive and rehash the past, 
we can never go back and live in it. And although we think about and plan and hope for the future, that too is not where we live. We live here, now. So it's important to understand as Christians how we should live right now. So let's, let's talk about our present Thanksgiving carol. And it's really our life in Christ. The, the question I'd like to answer is, what should our Thanksgiving look like today in the here and now? So let's walk back through our scripture in Ephesians 5. And we're going to try to answer three questions. Who, how, and what? And the first question is who? Who is this Thanksgiving message for? And from the outset, outset of this passage, Paul makes it very personal. Look at verse 15. He says, look carefully then how you walk. And if you look back in the, the, the start of chapter 15, he says, he addresses beloved children in verse, five, verse 1. And he addresses the saints in verse 3. And he addresses the children of light in verse 8. So, so Paul is addressing the redeemed, those that are his children, his saints. He's talking to you and to me. So Paul gives us direction. He gives us road signs here to begin as to how we are to walk and how we are to best live a life of gratitude and thanksgiving. So if you look at verse 15, he first says, this is the first road sign, the direction that he gives us. He says, look carefully how you walk. He's saying, know your surroundings. Be discerning. Knowing that temptations are there. That Satan, a lion, prowls around like a roaring lion. If you were my kids, I would be telling them to get your eyes off your phone and look, look around when you're going through a busy airport and pay attention to who's around you. Because that's what Paul is calling us to here. He's, he's telling us to look carefully, be alert, because Satan is everywhere. His demons are all around. He also tells us to look carefully how you walk. And when scripture talks about a, our walk, it's your daily lifestyle the moment to moment, the minute by minute. And I, I've found as I've gotten older that I really need to pay attention to how I physically walk. I lose my balance more easily. I have to watch out for potholes, slippery slopes, banana peels. <laughs> and Paul is telling, this, telling us all that right here. He's saying, watch how you walk, your walk with faith, your walk with Christ. He's telling you to watch out for the potholes, the slippery slopes, the banana peels, anything that puts you in the flesh. It's much harder to be thankful when you're angry, when you're jealous, when you're bitter. And that's where our enemy wants to put us so that we're not thankful, that we do not have hearts of gratitude. So Paul is telling us initially to look carefully how you walk. But then he says, not as unwise, but as wise. And Paul is contrasting the way you walk before Christ, being unwise, unbelieving, foolish, fleshly, with how you are walking right now, being wise, having the mind of Christ in the spirit, walking circumspectly, not carelessly. He's, he's giving, us, giving us a sign to not walk unwisely, but walk wisely. And then he says, making the best use of time in verse 16. So is there anybody in this room that likes to waste time? I do. I can say I waste a lot of time. But Paul is telling us, he's making a contrast of efficiency versus inefficiency. Good time management versus poor time management. 
usefulness versus wastefulness. So do you spend some of your time being ungrateful, unthankful, bitter, or resentful? Because that's what Paul is contrasting here. I'm putting all these things in the context of gratitude and thankfulness because that's where we're at tonight. But that's what Paul is talking about. He's telling you to make the best use of the time that God has given you. Then fourth, he tells us, walk carefully because the days are evil. There is so much evil around us, so much ingratitude. People are mean-spirited, angry, ungrateful. We truly are the me generation. What do I get? What's in it for me? I'm first. It's all about me. But being grateful, being thankful, crucifies yourself. Being thankful recognizes God as the source of, of everything. Being thankful says God be praised in the midst of good or bad. Being thankful sees beyond circumstances to the plan of God. Being thankful sees beyond the pain to the sovereignty of God. So let us remember time is short. God is coming back. We will answer for every careless word and deed, sins of commission, and omission. And then Paul in verse 17 says, don't be foolish. Understand God's will. Scripture tells us fools don't know God. That's what Psalm 14.1 tells us. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. So not being a fool and understanding God's will for your life really means knowing God's word and living it out. It is letting the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And then he says in verse 18, don't be drunk, be spirit filled. And in the context of the Ephesian church, Paul is describing how the pagans worshiped at his time. The way they worshiped and communed with their gods was at times through drunkenness, through drunken orgies. And Paul is saying, don't live like that. And he's contrasting their worship with the way God wants you to worship. He is saying, don't live that way. Don't walk satisfying the lusts of the flesh. Paul says in Galatians 5, 16, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Walking in the flesh is debauchery. It's dissipation, it's wickedness, it's ungodly and it's unholy. Instead, we are to be filled with the spirit. You understand that that's a command, right? It's an imperative in the Greek. He's not asking He's telling. So it's, it's, it's important that we understand what Paul means by being filled with the Spirit. Because it's different than being baptized into the body of Christ or sealed with the promised Holy Spirit or being indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Those are all statements of fact. Those are things that are done to you. Seven times in Scripture, Scripture tells us to be baptized into the body of Christ. But it's never command, we are never commanded to do that. It is something that is done to us. Here, God is commanding us to do something. It's important that we understand also the, the tense of this verb. When he's saying be filled, he's saying be being feel, filled continuously that it's not a one-time event. And ways to look at that would be, it's not like you're filling a glass of water and when you're filled, you're filled. That's not what this verse is talking about. This verse is talking about a continuous, consuming passion for Christ. It's talking about a boat with the sail being 
pushed along by the wind of the Spirit. It's being altogether consumed or yielding to the power of God. And it's ongoing. It's continuous. It's not a one-time event. Think of this also. Scripture also talks about being filled with sorrow, filled with anger, filled with joy. It's the same verb in those instances in Scripture. And when you're filled with anger, it, inf- it, uh, uh, it affects the entirety of your being sometimes. And that's what he's talking about in his verse. When you are filled with the Spirit, it should affect the way you talk, the way you walk, and the way you act. That's why when the early apostles on the day of Pentecost were filled with the Spirit, what did their viewers think they were? They thought that they were drunk. But it was truly because they were being filled with the Spirit. And that's the contrast that Paul is making in this verse. Don't be drunk. Be filled with the Spirit. This passage is also parallel to Scripture in Colossians chapter 3. And being filled with the Spirit is the same, has the same meaning as Colossians 3.16 where he says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. They are parallel. They are the same thing. So when we are filled with the Spirit, it means that we are, we are being, let, we are dwelling in the, in the word of Christ richly. So that is the first question of who? Who is this scripture intended for? It's for the redeemed. But then the second question I want us to think about is, how does it start? How does our thanksgiving start? Well, being thankful, as we will talk about, first starts with receiving the Holy Spirit. So it's talking about the redeemed, salvation, being born again. If you do not have the Holy Spirit, you do not have thanksgiving the way that we're going to talk about here in a couple minutes. Being filled is the key verb in this passage of Scripture. So it is the the verb or the the thing that drives uh, verses 19, 20, and 21. So look at verses 19, 20, and 21 again with me. Once we are filled with the Spirit, these become the consequences of that filling. And there are five participles in these last three verses. Participles are adjectives that act like verbs. And you'll see them because they all end in ing. There's five of them. Look at this scripture. I'll just point them out. You see addressing, singing, making, giving, and submitting. So when you're filled with the Spirit, you are addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And then you are singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. And you are giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then you are submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So without the Holy Spirit's filling, the verse that we're going to focus on, verse 20, you can't be giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ if you are not filled with the Spirit. It's not something that we do out of the flesh the way that verse describes. So next, let's think about the what. What does this giving thanks look like? And I think you'll understand that you have to be spirit-filled to give thanksgiving like this. Look at verse 20. He says, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. This giving thanks, it's not flippant. It's not matter of fact. It's not mom telling you to use your magic words. Say please and thank you. If you look back at the the last phrase of verse 19, it says, with your heart. 
And that's key. We give thanks the way Paul is talking about here from the heart. It's genuine. It's sincere. It's not just magic words. It's driven by the Holy Spirit. And then he said, says, always, giving thanks, always. So there is no season of life, no day, no circumstances when it is not right and fitting to give thanks to God. Never. And you, you realize that's what that word always means, right? You say, you might say, you don't know my life. And then someone else might say, you don't know my wife. Of course, I would never say that. <laughs> but always recognizes that God is in control of your life. He is sovereign and providential over, over your life and all of your circumstances. That's why Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, give thanks in all circumstances. He's saying the same thing. All circumstances means always. We might feel unthankful at times, but that is your own sinful problem. It's always right to be thankful to God. And it's not contradictory to experience varied emotions at the same time. Sometimes we don't feel thankful. Scripture tells us that we are to be sorrowful yet always rejoicing. You see those two contrasting emotions. And sometimes that happens to us where we don't feel thankful, but understand this is a command. Always. Joni Erickson Tata, and if you know her story, as a teenager, she dove into a lake head first, hit a rock, and became a quadriplegic. But she says this, giving thanks is not a matter of feeling thankful, it's a matter of obedience. I'm sure there were many, many days that she did not feel like being thankful. If you know her story of injury, pain, and recovery, what a testimony of being filled with the Spirit that is. You don't always have to feel thankful. But it's the recognition that my life is in God's sovereign hand. And everything is conforming to me. To the overall purpose of what God is doing in your life is to conform you to the, the likeness of Christ. So he says, giving thanks always. And then he says, and for everything. I, mean, you, I hope you're understanding why, this, why you need to be spirit-filled for everything. There is no limit. It's the beautiful, but it's also the painful, the horrible. This requires humility. The humble person realizes that he or she doesn't deserve anything, nothing. But we understand that God is sovereign. He doesn't work in unknowns. Nothing catches him by surprise. Nothing is by accident. God, Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11, works all things according to the counsel of his will. There's no wiggle room in that verse either. It's all. So imagine or think about the worst thing that has ever happened to you or will happen to you. Then think about what this verse says to do. Always. For everything. A loss of job, a loss of a child, a loss of a loved one, a health issue. Now you see why being filled with the Spirit is necessary. We could never do this in our own strength. We would never want to. We want to second-guess God. We want to complain and grumble. But God wants us to be thankful. This is God's will for you. And then you see who this thanksgiving is to. 
he ends the verse by saying, to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Considerate is who you are to be thankful to. A loving heavenly Father with a big heart. The God that works all things together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. It's for your good and his glory. And we are able to approach the Father, the verse says, because of the life, death, and resurrection of God the Son. It is because of Christ's righteousness and his atoning sacrifice that we are able to go boldly to the, God, to the throne of God, his, his throne of grace, and give him thanks. So as I conclude, I, I would ask you to take a moment to consider, am I a thankful person? Not just tomorrow, on Thanksgiving, but every day. But more importantly, am I a spirit-filled person? Because that's, that's the important piece of this scripture. If you're not spirit-filled, you can't have Thanksgiving like this. The answer to giving thanks always and for everything and living in the spirit f- filled, uh, spirit-filled life is to dwell richly in the word of Christ. It's to put this in your heart. You want to know how to be spirit-filled? It's dwelling richly in the word of Christ. And then it just comes out. Praise and thanksgiving seeps out of you. It consumes you when you're yielded to the Spirit and you're obedient to his words. Warren Wearsby said this, the Christian who walks with the Lord and keeps constant communion with him will see many reasons for rejoicing and thanksgiving all day long. It's our closeness to Christ that empowers our thanksgiving. Pray with me. Dear Father, on this Thanksgiving Eve, may this be our song, that we would give thanks always and for everything, in the good and the beautiful, but also in the painful times, the discouragements of life, and in the midst of grief when we suffer and experience loss. Help us to better understand your refining wisdom. In the days that come, may we dwell more richly in the word of Christ. May we live spirit-filled lives, obedient lives that honor you, singing a new song of gratitude and thanksgiving for your amazing grace and love. We love you, Lord. It is in Christ's name we pray. Amen.